very uh, unusual series. And tomorrow, join us for the adventures of Philip Marlowe. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow on tw us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. Aries. I'm 26 now and living in Pennsylvania, but when I was growing up, I lived in Montpelier, Vermont. My summers were spent hiking mountains, swimming in lakes, and exploring expansive forests. I knew that my state had bears and rattlesnakes in its more secluded, mountainous regions, but I never imagined that there was anything more terrifying than those out there. When I was 19, my friend Emily and I went to Moss Glen Falls for a day of swimming and picnicking. It gave us a nice change of scenery from campus. The waterfall is located in Stowe, which is a remote town in Vermont that has a population of barely 4,000. Emily was from another state and had never really seen much of the area beyond our college's campus. So I figured showing her some of Vermont's quaint locations was in order. The day was perfect. We had packed plenty of food, sunscreen, and towels. And since it was a weekday afternoon, there was no one else there at the falls, except for an elderly couple who left not long after we got there. We spread our towels out on a large rock by the falls and alternated between climbing up the waterfall edges to get to the swimming pools and relaxing in the late afternoon sun. It was peaceful, and it was a perfect break after a long day of homework and classes. As the day wore on, Emily wanted to explore some of the trails near the falls. I was familiar with a few of them and tried to keep her on those. What I didn't account for was that she would insist on exploring some of the more outlying trails and that we would consequently get lost. We spent nearly an hour walking in circles, our arms and legs getting covered in mosquito bites and our bathing suits drying uncomfortably onto our skin. We had the flashlights on our phones to give us a little light once the sun set, but they didn't do much to illuminate the dense undergrowth shrouding both sides of the trail. Finally, we came across a blackberry patch that we were pretty sure we had seen earlier. So by logical default, we started heading down the path closest to the bushes. Emily kept asking me if I heard twigs snapping near us, and I brushed it off as a city girl being afraid of deer or rabbits. I didn't hear anything myself, so I figured she was feeling paranoid due to it being the first time that she was lost in the woods. Then, I heard it. The noise came from somewhere behind us, and it was too loud to be a small animal like a rabbit. I figured it was another person out walking, or maybe a herd of deer passing through. Stowe has never been a populous town, and the locals could argue that there's more deer than people in the area. I ignored the uneasy feeling building in the pit of my stomach and kept walking chalking it up to my friend's paranoia rubbing off on me, and I babbled senselessly about cute guys to keep Emily and I distracted. After another ten minutes of walking, we finally came in sight of the trailhead. There was a large boulder there with a plaque on it, dedicated to a young woman who had been murdered at the falls back in 1991, and right beyond that was my car. As we neared the boulder, Relief evident on Emily's face, a weird noise came from the woods behind us. It sounded almost like a cat, but it was distorted and static, like it was coming out of an old radio. My first instinct was that the cat was wounded or in danger. I've always been an animal lover, and if there was a hurt cat, I wasn't about to leave it to become a coyote snack. I turned around, ignoring Emily begging me to just get in the car, 
and peered back into the trail opening. I gave Emily the keys and told her to get our towels, and I promised I'd be back momentarily. If I didn't find the cat right away, I wasn't going to spend forever looking for it, but I couldn't just drive away either. With the loss of the second flashlight, the woods seemed to be a bit more eerie to me, and the darkness was nagging at my peripheral vision. I walked a little ways down the path as I called to the cat, hoping to locate it by its meow, but I didn't hear anything for several moments. I was about to give up when I heard a low, out-of-place laugh behind me. I spun around, my heart beating too fast, but all I saw was a large buck. I remember muttering something about stupid, sneaky deer. Then I headed back to the trailhead. That was when the deer laughed again, and I froze. The harsh sound was completely unnatural. For those of you who don't know, deer make sounds like grunts, bleats, and snorts. They don't make any sort of laughter-like noises, and even if they did, it wouldn't have the same cadence as a human's laugh would. And as this deer's did, this situation was weird and unnerving, and I kept hoping that someone would pop their head out from around a tree and tell me it was a prank. That didn't happen. The deer took a few steps towards me, and then the odd cat sound came from it again. I almost literally threw my hands up in a nope gesture, and I started walking away from it as quickly as I could. I was almost inside of the end of the trail, when I felt something snag my hair. I swatted it away, thinking it was a branch, since there was a lot of low-hanging trees along the trail, but the sensation returned instantly. I reached up to tug my hair free, but it wouldn't come loose. I turned to face the offending tree, my heart thumping in shock. The deer, now on its hind legs, had my hair caught on one of its antler points. The snarls from a day of swimming and hiking were entangled around its antler, and I could feel its cold breath on my face. Not warm, not hot, but icy cold breath wreathed around me. I let out the most shrill scream I had ever heard myself make, and I violently yanked my hair off of its antlers. I sprinted for my car, screaming the whole way for Emily to start it. I heard the engine turn when I neared the boulder, and she didn't hesitate to floor it as soon as I was in the car. The tears streaming down my face were enough motivation. She didn't question me until we were nearly five miles from Moss Glen. I told her about the weird noises and the deer getting up in my face. I told her it startled me, and that on top of the stress of being lost was just enough to make me panic. She bought my explanation, agreeing that we were both super tired and adding that my mind was probably playing tricks on me. I haven't returned to Stowe since then, even though I visited Vermont recently. I know there's probably some sort of rational explanation for what I saw and heard, but I haven't been able to find what that would be. What I never told Emily that night was that the buck had fangs or how there had been blood on its mouth. I never shared that the huge animal was able to sneak up on me noiselessly, and I didn't bother telling her that it had the coldest breath I'd ever felt. She was my friend, but that didn't mean she would believe a crazy story. Emily, if you're reading this, I hope you know I didn't want to lie. I was panicked, and in my 19-year-old mind, I didn't want to get labeled as crazy or a liar. Please forgive me, and please, never go to Moss Glen alone. So for the past few months, there's been something that seems to be stalking my house. Weird things began to happen soon after we started to clear out some of the wooded area behind my house. 
At first, I didn't think anything of the weird sounds, and the neighbor's dog alerting to something in the woods because we have coyotes in the area. Now with someone that lives in a large family, we all like to joke about things like this being a supernatural creature of some sort, but none of us really gave that any real thought. After the weird happenings continued, I started to get more nervous. Me being nervous leads to dumb decisions. So when I smelled something that smelled like a rotting corpse, I decided to take an impromptu walk in the woods. It was probably around 10 p.m. when I left the house and made my way over to the tree line with the only flashlight on my phone. I heard something to the side of me. It sounded like a twig snapping, so I backed up and shined my light to the side. There were two pinpoints of light, which looked like eyes reflecting from my phone's light. Thinking it was probably a deer, as it was too high to be one of my cats or dog, I just started talking to it. Things like, hi there, and it's okay, come here. Just as the thing began moving towards me, my neighbors let out their dog. She ran in front of me and began to growl. It was a deep, angry sound which I had never heard her make before. I quickly ran back into my house and checked over the video feed that was pointed towards the barn. It hadn't caught much other than me standing there and the two reflecting eyes. When the dog didn't calm down after about five or so minutes, I went back out, this time only standing on the porch. I whistled to the dog and waited a few seconds. I nearly jumped out of my skin when I heard my whistle again. I stood for a few seconds, thinking it could have just been an echo, but I heard it again. It sounded just like what had left my mouth just a minute before. And then I heard my own voice saying, it's okay. It repeated it over and over. At this point, I was terrified, so I yelled, Sadie, home, and ducked inside my house. After locking all the doors, I ran to the cameras, and all I saw was a deer-like head sticking out of the tree line. I looked at it in horror. I remember it having antlers, but they were larger than those on any buck I had ever seen in this area. I slept in the front room that night, with all the lights on. Nothing happened for a few nights, so I figured I could sleep out in the front room without having to keep my eyes on every window. It was about 1 or 2 a.m. when I woke up to scuffing on the wooden deck. I watched the camera as a black figure climbed onto the two chairs underneath the camera. I stayed as still as I could, watching it as it turned its head, looking towards the camera, as if it was trying to make sure I was aware of its presence. I saw that it had the same abnormal antlers as the thing that had been in the woods days before. I rolled over and tried to get some sleep, and woke up the next morning leaning against the glass of my door, which was probably unrelated and just stress-related sleepwalking. The next day it snowed, so we put the cats in the garage so they would be warm. I stepped out after the sunset to go sit in the hot tub for a while. I was in for probably five minutes before I started hearing a cat meowing. I quickly got out and went inside, knowing that there were no cats outside so there would be nothing making that sound. That night, I called my then boyfriend and asked him about something he had seen. He told me when we were playing a game of hide and seek tag that he had felt like something was watching him. And when he turned around, he said he saw something partially hidden behind a tree. He claimed it was a humanoid figure, taller than he was, with what looked like antlers and dirty, sallow looking skin. I told him about what I had seen and heard, and when I mentioned how it seemed to mimic my voice, he said that he thought he had heard me calling out for him, but when he followed, he just ended up lost in the woods. This thing still comes around,
but I try not to be scared of it, as if it was going to attack, it would have already. Even with positive thinking, I still feel like I'm being hunted. I was visiting Santa Fe, New Mexico about a year ago with some family. It was a typical trip, the usual boring stuff surrounding car rides and all that. But when we get there, my family decided that we should go camping. We're all on board with this idea, so we grab the tents and all that and head out. Now as some background, my family has some Navajo blood in them and thus causes them to be very superstitious. I've heard the skinwalker stories before and I never believe them because there's no way at all something like that could be true. But I've been told that whatever you do, do not look at them or interact with them. So we get to our camping site and there's five of us and we're all hanging out around the fire with our tents all set up near us. Around what I assume was 11.30 or so at night, I'm a few beers deep and I tell everybody I'm gonna take a piss real quick. So I walk about 20 yards away and suddenly I'm overcome with the most intense feeling of fear that you can possibly imagine. I was absolutely terrified and I had no idea why. Suddenly, I no longer have to use the restroom and I almost immediately book it back to the fire. As I'm running, I just feel like if I don't make it back within seconds, I'll die. I'm running as if my life depends on it. So I get back and everybody is freaking out, being the superstitious bunch that they are, and this is all beginning to make sense to me. They tell me almost immediately that it's a skinwalker, and to change the topic, and dismiss all thoughts of it immediately. So eventually, we somehow manage to forget about it, and we head into our tents to sleep. About what I assume was two hours after we went into the tents, I hear movement outside, and the same feeling of fear from earlier comes over me again. I tell myself not to think of it, but I simply can't do it. Too scared to even speak or move, I can't wake up my family. The light provided from the smoldering coals outside revealed a tall, humanoid shape creeping around outside. I'm not sure how long it was there, but the feeling eventually went away and I was unable to get any sleep that night. Regardless, it was the most terrifying thing I've ever experienced and I hope I never have an interaction with these creatures again. I live in Southern Maryland on a large plot of land. We have three large farm dogs, two of whom are German Shepherds. They're very used to the various animals that pursue our property and rarely get spooked or upset. We also have lots of livestock and it's not uncommon for us to lose a random animal or find a pile of chicken feathers in the corner of our property. However, we've always been able to explain it or add extra protection for our flocks. Around eight months ago, we started losing chickens at an alarming rate. They would just disappear, and even our shepherds couldn't scent them anywhere on our property. For a while, we figured it was just a barred owl or some other bird of prey. The main problem with that theory was that 10 would disappear at a time, rather than a normal one, two max. We decided to put up a trail cam to watch our most eastern flock. Almost immediately, the problem stopped, so we took them down. But then it got stranger. I've always gotten sleep paralysis, and like to believe I'm pretty comfortable with my sleep paralysis demon. It's never really been something that concerned me. However, around the same time as we started losing chickens, I would see something different in my sleep paralysis. Where my demon always chills out in the corner of the room and doesn't move, this thing would hang from my rafters and move back and forth across them 
almost like a really quick sloth. It had long ass fingers and looked really skinny, like a super emaciated human with a weirdly long head. I've noticed that it literally always stared at me from any part of the room it's in. At the time, I decided not to worry about it and figured it was just a bad bout of anxiety. Which brings us to September of 2018. One night I woke up around two, completely able to move my body. Everything seemed normal. No one else was sleeping in the house that night, but that's pretty standard around that time of year. I glanced up at my rafters and saw the long fingered thing moving and looking at me. I immediately turned on my bedside lamp and it was gone. Yet again, I chalked it up to stress and decided to go downstairs to grab a cup of water. All of our dogs were happily asleep, so I went back to bed and turned off the light. The second it was dark, I could see it again without my eyes having to adjust. This freaked me out enough, but all of a sudden, I heard our Rottweiler get up and start growling at the door. He rarely barks, let alone growls. I called out his name, but he kept going. He got louder and louder until the dogs woke up and joined in. At this point, I was flipping shit, so I turned my light back on and grabbed my hunting rifle and flashlight. I went downstairs and took two of the dogs outside. I swear to God, I have never heard a night so silent. I moved my flashlight slowly around the perimeter, looking for the shine of eyes or really anything. All of a sudden, our chickens started going crazy, like so loud they distracted the dogs who sprinted out towards them. I followed them only to find zero chickens outside and our fence torn down. There's no animals in our area that could even try to do that, so we hauled ass back inside and camped out for the evening. It was quiet after that, and when morning came, all of the chickens were safely inside their coop. I stupidly figured the problem was solved and decided not to worry about it. The only thing was, I started seeing the long-fingered rafter thing every time I turned out my light. Eventually, I got so freaked out, we decided to call a shaman. She told us that we had a Wendigo problem and that she would come and sage the house. We opened every single window and door and let her do her thing. And since then, we haven't had a problem indoors. The issue now is that when we walk our dogs at night or go to put our chickens inside, I swear I feel something watching me. I've had a couple of other people bring up that they feel weird outside at night and nobody goes outside alone anymore. Whenever we walk our dogs near the woods, even in broad daylight, they'll get so anxious that we've taken to walking them on a leash. In general, we just avoid the roads near the forest entirely. The creepiest part is sometimes at night, we hear lots of screaming. We often assume it's just the coyotes, but every once in a while, it's just enough that we get scared. A couple times it's been a lone shriek, which is very uncommon for coyotes or even foxes. A few nights ago, we were asleep in bed when we heard a scream from directly outside our window. My partner was worried that someone was hurt, so we opened our window and yelled, Is everyone okay? We heard a loud shuffling sound, almost like someone scrambling off our roof. It sounded heavier than a bird of prey, but way lighter than a person. Our dog started barking, and within a minute, we heard another scream, a good half mile away.
My grandmother had a deathbed confession that I was not supposed to hear. A story written by Delusional Grandeur 8. Alzheimer's disease is one of the most insidious ways to watch a loved one die. It is never a slow, steady decline into madness that one could prepare for. There are moments of lucidity that were so poignant that it would be impossible to think that they would not slip any further, only to have that hope dashed in an instant when they forgot who you were or called for a relative who was long deceased. I was always close with my grandparents who took me in when I was six. My mom had passed away from cancer and my dad had succumbed to an addiction problem shortly thereafter. I don't really remember my mom being sick, and that was probably for the best. I always recalled her beautiful brown eyes and how soothing her voice was to me. She showered me with affection, and I always felt safe and loved around her. My father was another matter entirely. He was rarely around, and I only had a couple memories of him. But what stuck with me was that I always got very queasy any time the memory struck. He had piercing blue eyes and a voice that bellowed so strongly that I couldn't help but feel threatened by him. He was, apparently, from a family with a lot of money as I was provided a good life that was above the means that my grandparents could have afforded on their blue-collar jobs. I grew up happy and healthy and didn't question anything until my mid-twenties, after the death of my grandpa. I decided to move back home to help out my grandma. It was about the same commute to my office as a consultant. And I knew it bothered my grandma to stay alone in the house. After some light resistance, she reluctantly agreed to have me stay. Within the first couple weeks of my return home, I noticed that there was something odd about her grieving. Several times I heard her say, He, he can't do this, in between sobs. And when I went to console her, she clutched a picture of my parents. If I ever attempted to take the frame from her, she'd shriek like a wounded animal and beg me to give her space. Each and every time I obliged, and she would return to her gregarious self upon seeing me again. Not long after, she began to behave more erratically. She essentially became nocturnal, sleeping through the day and wandering around the house at night usually doing chores and finding things for me to work on during the weekends. I'd awake to find drawers open and their contents dumped on the floor. Lights on in every room except the study, and random objects moved a couple inches to the left. Not knowing what to do, I brought her to a neurologist who delivered the bad news of Alzheimer's disease and told me to hire a nurse or consider moving her to a facility. I decided to go with the nurse, and things seemed to stabilize for a bit. She was forgetful, and sometimes thought I was my grandfather. We were both named Stephen, but she always called me Stevie. It was hard at times, and seeing a once proud woman Having to be reminded of who the people she loved were was tragic. After a particularly bad day, I took a couple of Benadryl before bed, hoping to sleep through the night. I was basically in a coma until I heard an unmistakable bang, glass shattering and screaming. I sprinted towards my grandma's bedroom and was terrified at the sight of her, covered in blood. I gasped 
at seeing her hand trembling with the pistol, her eyes wide in terror, pointing at the mirror she had clearly shot at. Thankfully, the bleeding was from the glass cutting her, and not from a gunshot wound, and I darted to the bathroom after taking the gun. Much to my astonishment, it didn't even register to her that I was there or that she had injured herself. She kept staring directly into the shattered mirror and repeated, Stephen, what do we do now? He knows, and kept raising her voice, anticipating a response that was never coming. I immediately called 911 and followed the paramedics to the hospital, perturbed at the events that just unfolded. Even though I wanted to respect her wishes and had the means to care for her, I knew she was a danger to herself and potentially others and could no longer stay at home. I was devastated as she called into the hallway to ask to speak to me, hoping to keep my emotions in check for the night. Her gaze narrowed as I pulled up a chair and sat beside her. I grabbed her hands, clammy and wrinkled with age, and asked her how she was feeling. She sat up suddenly and in a stern tone said, Stevie, what I'm about to tell you is something that your grandfather and I never intended for you to know. He tried our whole lives to shield you from everything, but unfortunately, my time is running out, and you need to know the truth, she continued. The circumstances in which you came to us were much different than what you were told. Your parents had a wonderful marriage, living a life of luxury and travel most could only dream about. You were born a beautiful, healthy boy, and there was no doubt that you were going to be loved and cherished by them. They moved to England for a time, and naturally Communication wasn't as consistent as when they lived here. But we weren't concerned at first. You were her bundle of joy and were ecstatic when she agreed to come home for a visit with you. When we saw her, we were equally enamored with you, as we were mortified with how your mother looked. She had gained weight to more than double her size and her tan skin was almost a pasty white. She refused to even hug us because she had strict orders from your father to never risk being bruised. She kept droning on about her sacrifices and left abruptly with you in the middle of the night after receiving a phone call from your father. This didn't sit well with us, and we tried to find out where they lived in England for a surprise visit. It was remarkably difficult to track them down, and we were heartbroken over the prospect that the two of you could potentially be in trouble and not help. We spent every time we could to find you, and eventually got a tip that your father's family had property in the States. We set out immediately to the house, hoping to find out your whereabouts, but nothing could prepare us for what we saw. I instinctively slumped in my chair, perplexed. There was no way this could be a deranged rambling, but it was just too much to believe. Could she really have kept a secret like this from me? And why? My grandmother squeezed my hand and continued. The address led us to a mansion surrounded by woods on all sides and perched on top of a hill. We were greeted by a British butler who asked to see our invitations. We bluntly told him who we were and demanded to see you or someone in the family that could tell us where you were. And we would not budge until we were sure of your well-being. 
The butler calmly excused himself and said that the master of the house would arrive shortly to answer all of our inquiries and invited us inside. I was shocked to see your father in the doorway beaming from ear to ear like his guests of honor had arrived. Dorothy, Stephen, what a wonderful surprise. So glad you can make it. Your grandfather was irate and demanded to see you and your mother, or else there'd be hell to pay. Stephen went on berating your father for another minute before that scumbag interrupted yelling, Enough! so loudly that the room seemed to shake. Please, have a drink and I will provide you with everything you need to know. And you will be able to see both Christina and Stevie tonight as you walked to the bar cart to prepare a couple of drinks. I was elated at the news but confused by the deliberate break in communication. Was the silence from our daughter involuntary, or had we done something to upset her? Your dad took a puff on his cigar while handing us a drink, and exclaimed after he blew out a ring of smoke, I am so excited for you to witness this. Your grandson is more special than you could ever imagine. I was unsettled, but your grandfather pressed for more information. For generations, the royal families from all over the world have had a special ritual that helps bring us all closer and ensures that we solidify our power. We never know who gets picked and from where, which means that the Chosen Ones can hail from anywhere. Each generation brings a different number of Chosen Children who actually rule the world and they in turn must seek out the right sacrifice to beget more chosen children. This has progressed for centuries, with the chosen leading regardless of titles and who held the crown of king or queen. Now, your grandson is the only chosen in this generation. This has never happened since the pact began, making him the chosen of chosens. Let us join the feast and celebrate. We were led to a great dining hall that had people from all over the world. And all were staring at the stage on the far end of the room. There, your mother held you and looked down lovingly at you and was cooing and speaking softly. Stephen instinctively screamed, Carolyn! At that exact moment, a dark shadow began to envelop you two. All of the guests began chanting in a language I couldn't recognize, and all the lights went dark to the point where you couldn't see anything. The only visible light came from the pair of red eyes on the stage, which grew wider and larger as the chanting accelerated. And then... The chanting turned into a deafening screech that knocked me off my feet. When I came to, all the people included had vanished with only their robes remaining. The only other person left was you, completely covered in blood. To this day, we don't know what happened, but there was a box that was by your side and a tiny little key. As we approached you, a guttural voice exclaimed that the boy must open it when the time is right. The location of the box and key is scribbled on the back of the picture of your parents that I love. You must find it before they do. As she finished, she took a deep breath and closed her eyes. I sat with my mouth wide open as she passed on, not knowing what to think.
Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we do get started, I do want to let you know this program is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis at support.greatdetectives.net. Net. And we also have a mailing address at that website. Uh, you can become a monthly ongoing supporter of the show and help us achieve key goals for making the show better at patreon.greatdetectives.net. But now it's time for today's episode of Hearthstone of the Death Squad. From December 13th, 1951, here's the marriage annulment case. Annulment murder case. Tonight we again present the famous Hearthstone of the Death Squad Implacable manhunter of the Metropolitan Police In one of his greatest investigations entitled The Marriage Annulment Murder Case with Peter Capel as Conrad Faulkner and Peggy Sanford as Isabel Gomez. And now, Inspector Hearthstone in the marriage annulment murder case. As the curtain rises, we see the luxurious living room of Conrad Faulkner, who is handsome, graying, and middle-aged. He is looking in a puzzled way at his very young wife as he holds in his hand a newspaper clipping, which he has just given him. And we hear him say the words that lead to one of Inspector Hearthstone's most famous murder cases. This newspaper clipping, my dear Glenda, why did you give it to me? From where does it come? From this afternoon's paper. Read it, Conrad. It's about some man and his wife whose marriage was annulled. But I don't know the people. Their marriage was annulled in court. Because it was proved they never lived together as husband and wife. Yes, so it says, but... Conrad, I wouldn't ask this if I thought it would hurt you. But couldn't our own marriage be ended the same way? I mean, by annulment. It's so much easier than divorce. So my sweet little wife finally comes to the conclusion, as I warned her, that marrying me might be her... Great mistake. You did warn me, Conrad. But when Father died and left you my guardian, I felt helpless and alone. I wanted someone to protect and care for me. I never thought... I couldn't be made to believe that... That one day love would come to you, huh? And now you find it has? Yes, deeply. Terribly, Conrad. I needn't ask, Glenda. Is he of your age? I'm torn between love for him and duty and gratitude and affection for you. But I'd rather die than live without him. I'm not unprepared for this. After all, it's the course of nature. I blame myself. When I first saw what was coming, I should have put him right out of my mind. But it was like lightning from the sky, Conrad. Don't tell me anything more, Glenda. There are limits. Where are you going, Conrad? To my club, where I shall stay until we have the matter of an annulment of our marriage settled. Don't worry. It will end well. 
Conrad, you don't hate me for this. Hate is a bitter word. Oh. In the fantastic world in which we live, who can predict? What? I may meet this young lover of yours, Glenda, and be his best man at your wedding. Conrad! Goodbye. I'll phone Eric right away. Eric, this is Glenda. I told Conrad, and he said it was all right. Glenda, sweetheart. Wait, Eric. There was something in the way he said it that makes me afraid. Afraid? Something in the tone of his voice, something in his eyes I'd never seen before. If he threatened you, I'll... Conrad isn't the kind who threatens. Tell me exactly what he said, Glenda. I told him I didn't want to hurt him, but that I loved you. And, and... And early the following morning, we see the cold and calculating Inspector Hearthstone of the Death Squad with his assistant, Detective Sam Cook, in the pastel-tinted bedroom of Glenda Faulkner. Its peaceful beauty contradicted by the horribly mutilated body of Glenda, which lies sprawling across her bed. And we hear the inspector say, A filthy sight, Sam. Clearly this is a murder of hate. Yeah, inspector. Stabbing her once wasn't enough. I counted ten places across her breast. The butler who reported the murder says her husband wasn't home last night. Yeah, he said he spent his night at his club. I wonder why. You ought to be here by now. Butler rung him up at the club. Hand me that newspaper on the floor beside her bed. Hey, Inspector. Hmm. Curious. The leading story was clipped from the front page. That's yesterday afternoon, Star Telegraph, Inspector. I guess she cut it out with that scissors on her sewing table. Hmm? Well, she couldn't have, Sam. These are pinking scissors. They don't cut a clean line, but in the pattern of a saw. They're the only scissors here, Inspector. Sam, phone the Star Telegraph. Find out what story they carried on the third column of yesterday's late edition. Yes, sir. There's a phone down the hall. Come in. You are Inspector Hearthstone? I'm Conrad Faulkner. This murdered woman's husband? Yes. But do not ask me to look at her. She was so young. So lovely. The issue at this moment is to discover her killer, Mr. Faulkner. If only I had not chosen last night of all nights to spend at my club. You cannot undo the past. No doubt you had an excellent reason for leaving your wife alone last night. A late business meeting, Inspector Hearthstone. And every minute of my absence can be accounted for. Uh, Aren't you getting a bit ahead of yourself? What? I didn't ask you for an alibi. Isn't the husband usually suspect when a wife is murdered, Inspector Hearthstone? Not always. You are a clever man, Inspector Hearthstone. I present the alibi, for I have a premonition that sooner or later I will be accused. Perhaps you are the clever one. Even at a time of tragedy, one cannot forget. Self-preservation is the first law of nature. Perhaps you can throw some light on this newspaper, Mr. Faulkner. Newspaper? Have you any idea what the subject of the story clipped from it was? Not the least idea, Inspector. Detective Cook and I found it beside your murdered wife's bed. It is completely a mystery to me. But how could it bear on Glenda's murder? Inspector Hearthstone. Oh, yes, Sam. Star Telegraph says that the story cut out from that paper was about a couple who had their marriage annulled because they never lived together as man and wife. Mr. Faulkner... Perhaps the information Detective Cook gives me has a direct bearing on your wife's murder. But how, Inspector? On what terms did you leave your wife when you left to spend the night at your club? When did you last see her alive? Did you return to this house during the night? What was your true reason for leaving? The reason I gave. Business. Glenda and I parted on the happiest terms. I know nothing of this newspaper story of annulment. It does not concern me. It concerns me. 
When a girl, obviously 25 years younger than her husband, is murdered... I was Glenda's guardian before our marriage. Mm -hmm. Her father and I were long business colleagues. Wine merchants of international repute. I in Barcelona, he in New York. Yes. On his death, he appointed me her guardian. You have already said that. Then, Glenda, left alone in the world, sought the wisdom and protection of age and asked me to be her husband. Our days were happy. And ended in her murder. A murder associated in some strange way with a newspaper story about a marriage annulment. So the question is... Is what? Was your young wife seeking to end her marriage to you by annulment because you had never lived together as man and wife? The suggestion offends me. Only one person had the motive to murder my wife. Who? A young man who was forcing unwelcome attentions upon her, Inspector Hearthstone, and whom she ordered out of her life yesterday. His name is Eric Jackson. Eric Jackson? Sounds phony to me, Inspector. One minute, Sam. It is not phony, Detective Cook. Here is Eric Jackson's address, Inspector Hearthstone. Hmm. You give his address as your own office, Mr. Faulkner. Exactly, Inspector. Eric Jackson is an employee of my firm. It is there where my murdered Glenda met him, only to have him form the unwelcome infatuation that caused her murder. Detective Cook and I will see this man, Mr. Faulkner. Hoping, of course, that it will relieve you of suspicion. It will, Inspector. I'll have my butler show you out. You rang, sir? Show these gentlemen to the door, Pickett. This way, Inspector Hoster. Oh, don't trouble, Pickett. We know the way. Good day, Mr. Faulkner. Pickett, bring me a double whiskey and soda. Better wait till the cops get out of the house, sir. That Hearthstone is a slick one. And what are you talking about? About this newspaper clipping I heard you and the missus arguing about yesterday afternoon, sir. Where did you find it? I venture you dropped it out of your pocket in front of her door when you came back to murder her last night. What? I'm offering it for sale, sir, to the highest bidder. It's between you and the cops. Ah, suppose you start off with, say, ten grand. Give me that clipping. And leave this house, Pickett. There's Mr. Faulkner's office, Inspector Hearthstone. Mm -hmm. For my dough, we're wasting our breath talking to that Eric Jackson. The guy he's trying to put the finger on. Sam, we have only suspicion, without evidence so far, that Faulkner murdered his wife. I'm interested in his butler. Odd situation. You mean Pickett? He served two terms for blackmail. What do you know? Oh, here's the door. Yes? You wish to see someone? I have Inspector Hearthstone of the Death Squad, Office of Criminal Investigation. This is Detective Cook. The police? But nothing has happened here. I heard you say you were Inspector Hearthstone. Can I help you? We're looking for Mr. Eric Jackson. Is he around? I'm Eric Jackson. But why... We're investigating the murder of your employer's wife. No. Mrs. Conrad Faulkner. She was found murdered in her bed less than an hour ago. Glenda murdered? Oh, no. No. That is what you get, Eric Jackson. For your illegitimate love match with that girl, Mr. Faulkner's wife. Who are you, sister? Isabel Gomez. I work long for Mr. Faulkner. I see all this brewing. Murder had to result. I accuse Eric Jackson, the man you have come here to arrest. Glenda murder. Oh, why didn't I call the police in time? Am I to assume by that, Mr. Jackson, that you had knowledge Mrs. Faulkner was in danger of being murdered? Of a certain he knew in advance. He killed her. He would have to know. Suppositions and accusations don't solve murders, Miss Gomez. Have you evidence? Evidence? No. But facts, yes. I'll hear your facts later, Miss Gomez. I suggest we go into this office, Mr. Jackson. Yes, Inspector Hearthstone. It's mine. Eric, suppose you start by telling me why you thought Mrs. Faulkner was in danger of being murdered. Glenda was murdered. Because she loved me. I've heard the contrary, but go ahead. She phoned me late yesterday afternoon, 
that her husband had agreed to have their marriage terminated so she could marry me. She told her husband, Conrad, that she was in love with me. Did she say whether the marriage was to terminate by divorce or annulment? Annulment? No, she didn't. But she did say there was something in her husband's eyes, something in the tone of his voice when he agreed to end their marriage that put her in deadly fear of him. Why didn't you report that to the police? She wasn't murdered because she asked for a divorce. Or because of our love for each other, Inspector Hearthstone? No. Glenda was her husband's ward, as well as his wife. He was also the executor of her father's estate and the sole custodian of the fortune her father left her. Yes? He embezzled every cent of her money. And the books of this company will prove it. Glenda became suspicious of him. It wasn't a murder of passion, Inspector Hearthstone. It was a cold and calculated murder to keep her husband from behind prison bars. Hmm, that may throw a new light on the case. I'm an expert accountant, and I know what I'm talking about. And Inspector Hearthstone... Yes? There's another reason Conrad Faulkner wanted Glenda out of the way. What reason? That woman in the outer office, Isabel Gomez... The one who accused me of murdering Glenda. How? Why? Because they worked the theft of Glenda's money together and want to be off together. And I can prove that, too. Detective Cook. Sam. Yeah, Inspector. Bring Isabel Gomez in here. Eric Jackson accuses her of theft and murder. Hearthstone of the Death Squad and the marriage annulment murder case continues in just a moment. Is this show coming to you on your car radio? How are your brakes? The pedal getting too close to the floorboards? And how about your lights, horn, windshield wipers? If they're not in shape, you're taking chances. Why do it? There are repair shops everywhere. <laughs> And now, back to Hearthstone of the Death Squad and the marriage annulment murder case. Investigating the murder of lovely young Glenda Faulkner, brutally stabbed to death in her own bed, Inspector Hearthstone is told by her older husband, Conrad Faulkner, that Glenda was receiving unwelcome attentions from Eric Jackson, a young man of her own age who works for him. Suspicion begins to point at Conrad when the inspector discovers a newspaper beside the murder bed with an item about a marriage annulment cut from it. And upon his questioning Eric Jackson, Eric accuses Conrad and Isabel Gomez, also employed by Conrad, saying that Isabel helped Conrad to embezzle his wife's fortune and that Conrad murdered his wife to prevent discovery. Now, a moment later, at Conrad Faulkner's office, Inspector Hearthstone is saying to his assistant, Detective Sam Cook... Detective Cook, bring Isabel Gomez in here. Eric Jackson accuses her of theft and murder. It is a lie. I do not steal. I do not murder. I didn't say murder, Inspector Hearthstone. I said theft. One minute, Eric. Swine! You pig, Eric. Shut up, Isabel. He is a swine, a pig, Detective Cook. Eric lies, Inspector Hearthstone. But he will not deceive you. What do you wish with me? I wish to know why you're wearing only one earring, Isabel. What? Why, I must have dropped it in the other room. I go see. No, you needn't. Here is its mate, a black jet earring. I picked it off the ground directly under the window of the bedroom where Glenda Faulkner was murdered. Those earrings, they can be bought at any department store in New York. Every woman you meet wears them. They're the fashion. We'll check up on that one fast, sister. Heaven help me, then. She is Glenda's murderess, Inspector Hearthstone. And I'll prove by a dropped earring. It is not my earring, Eric Jackson. The earring was not the only clue I found beneath the window. What? What, another? This star sapphire cufflink. Can either of you identify it? Eric? Isabel? I have never set eyes on it. And you, Eric? I think it's Conrad Faulkner. You lie, Eric. It is not Mr. Faulkner. You think it is the murdered girl's husband's cufflink, Eric? 
I'm not certain, Inspector Hearthstone, but it looks like one of those he wore. Thank you, Eric. And you, Miss Gomez. You will both please go to your homes and remain there. This office will be closed and sealed for police inspection. Come along, Sam. Okay, Inspector. I'm out of step, Inspector Hearthstone. Slap me down, but why aren't we pinching that dame? Do you think we could convict her on the evidence of this earring alone, Sam? Well, to sense you, she and the murdered girl's husband were at Tosum. We got her earring and his cuff link. Out off the murder scene. Right so. What are those newspapers you got under your arm, Inspector? Two copies of yesterday's Star Telegraph, Sam. With the story of that highly interesting marriage annulment checked in pencil on one. Where'd you get them? In the waste paper basket in the reception room of Mr. Faulkner's office. But he may not have put them there. That marriage annulment clipping seems to be turning up everywhere. We'll confront Faulkner with it, Sam, at his house within the next few minutes. Inspector Hearthstone, come in. I'm here too, Mr. Faulkner. My apologies, Detective Cook. My butler, Pickett, left my employ suddenly and without reason, so I answered the door myself. Your butler, Pickett, is a known criminal and blackmailer. You astonish me, Inspector Hearthstone. I failed to check his reference when I employed him. Oh, does this cufflink happen to be yours, Mr. Faulkner? Yes. It is one of a set that was presented to me. I never wore them. I put them aside in my desk at the office. You, uh, found it there, of course. No. On the ground directly beneath the window of your murdered wife's bedroom. How it got there, I cannot say. But this newspaper clipping may interest you, Inspector Hartstone. Newspaper clipping? Hmm. It does very much. Especially as it is a marriage annulment story from yesterday's Star Telegraph. My butler, Pickett, attempted to blackmail me for $10,000 for it. He overheard my wife, Glenda, presented to me as a possible way to have her marriage to me annulled. Really? So you admit it now? Admit that your wife came to you to have your marriage annulled? Just as I thought. I agreed to her plea quite readily. Ours was a marriage of convenience rather than love, Inspector Hearthstone. We did not live together as man and wife. Our marriage could have been annulled. But I thought no more of this clipping until Pickett attempted to use it as a means of blackmail. Faulkner, earlier today, you complimented me by calling me clever. And I returned it by saying perhaps you were the clever one. You were very gracious, Inspector Hearthstone. But now is no time for pretty words. Undoubtedly, you have come to reveal who murdered my wife. There is such a thing as being too clever, Mr. Faulkner. I quite agree, Inspector. After all, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And figuratively speaking, neither you nor I have eaten yet. But the records of the police show that the refusal of a wife to live with her husband provides a prime motive for murder. Good day, Mr. Faulkner. I'm not asking you this time why we're not making a pinch, Inspector. Sam, radio headquarters from the car. One, to search this house for the butler Pickett's body. Right. Two, have the police auditors check the books in Faulkner's office. And third... Here's the car. Back to headquarters quickly, Sam. <laughs> Now, back in Inspector Hearthstone's grim office at the death squad, we hear Detective Cook say... I'll give it to you fast, Inspector. The butler Pickett's not dead. He's drunk as a lord, shooting money like crazy. Get on with it, Sam. Report on Isabel Gomez. The murdered Glenda Faulkner's husband, Conrad, is putting up for Isabel in a lush apartment on East 53rd Street. Mm Mm-hmm. You got her black jet earring and his cuff link already found at the murder scene. Get on to the auditor's report on Faulkner's book, Sam. Yeah, uh, right here, sir. Well, let me see it. I haven't had time to read it myself. Hmm. The solution is in Faulkner's book, Sam, and in this neatly cut-out clipping of the marriage annulment story in the Star Telegraph. Yeah? I got everybody outside, Inspector Hearthstone. Faulkner, Isabel, and Eric Jackson. Bring them in, Sam. The case is solved. 
Come in, all of you. I reached the conclusion, Inspector Hearthstone, that your cleverness is bringing my wife's killer to arrest. Mr. Faulkner, an audit of your books reveals that every dollar of your wife's estate held in trust by you was embezzled. That is not a clever solution, Inspector. It is impossible. Neither was it clever of you, Faulkner, to put up for this woman, Isabel Gomez, in one of the most expensive apartments in the city. Is passionate love proof of murder, Inspector? I proudly say the money Conrad Faulkner spent on me was not embezzled from his murdered wife, Glenda. Let me at her. It's like I said, Inspector. Faulkner killed Glenda. He embezzled her money. Isabel helped him murder her. You, you have all the evidence, her earring, his cufflink, proof of a $500,000 theft. Easy, Eric. I'll kill them both. Grab him, Sam. <laughs> Eric Jackson is a murderer. What? Eric? Yes, Eric Jackson. You're a fool, Hearthstone. You're not fit to be a police officer. I deal in evidence. And you gave me too much. You planted Isabel's black jet earring on the scene... You planted Conrad Faulkner's cufflink along with it. And you cut this story of the marriage annulment from the newspaper. That's a lie. You cut it out with these shears. Found in a search of your room, Eric. Glenda cut it from the newspaper herself. In her room, with her scissors. The only scissors in Glenda's room were pinking shears. Shears that leave the pattern of a saw. You gave her the story, Eric. Gave her the idea to ask her husband for an annulment of their marriage... So you'd be free to murder her and have her husband accused. He embezzled her money. The proof is in his books. The proof in his books is that you, Eric Jackson, forged entries and took the money. Here's proof you did. All right, Hearthstone. I did. Detective Cook, charge him with willful murder. Take him to the cells. Out of that door, Jackson. Start moving. Is it not as I said, Inspector Hearthstone? You are the clever one, not I. Through your sheer stupidity, Faulkner, you made me believe you were perhaps the most clever suspect I'd ever met in my long experience as a police officer. But that's neither here nor there. It's my job to bring murderers to heel, and your wife's killer will end up in the electric chair. <laughs> Thus, Hearthstone of the Death Squad, right solved in the files of the marriage annulment murder case. The part of Inspector Hearthstone was played by Alfred Shirley, written by Frank Hummert, directed by Henry Howard, and is a presentation of CBS Radio. Listen in next Thursday night at the same time for Hearthstone of the Death Squad in Murder... And the little man with the big mustache. Coming right up, CBS Radio is proud to announce the premiere performance of Stars in the Air, a new program featuring Hollywood stars in special adaptations of all-time best screen comedies and romances. For tonight's premiere, Stars in the Air brings you James Stewart and Donna Reed in It's a Wonderful Life. Stay tuned for this Stars in the Air premiere, which follows immediately on most of these same stations. Blood and blood plasma are saving the lives of many a wounded man in Korea. We owe it to these brave men to supply the blood for their care. In the treatment of many casualties, there is no substitute for blood, and it is imperative that action be taken to ensure that an adequate supply is ready for immediate use. The Department of Defense is calling up for an immediate stepping up of blood collections. This month, our country is short 300,000 pints of blood. It's up to every one of us who is able to make up this staggering deficit. So call your Red Cross chapter or local blood donor center for an appointment to make your donation of blood for the armed forces. You will be doing your part in keeping America free.
Listen for Hearthstone of the Death Squad in Murder and the Little Man with the Big Mustache at the same time next Thursday night. Your announcer is Harry Kramer. And remember, it's two hours of music, the nation's favorite songs every Friday night on the CBS Radio Network. Hi, this is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site. We stream live OTR Westerns 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, along with putting out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, an interesting way to put that, I guess. So if I'm understanding, Hearthstone almost got the wrong guy because he thought that the guy was very clever. In fact, as a murderer. In fact, it was that the reason he looked very clever as a murderer was that he was very stupid as someone who wasn't a murderer. Wow. Well, at any rate, we actually have just one more week to go, so be sure and listen again next Tuesday for our last Hearthstone of the Death Squad uh, episode. Also on coming up tomorrow is The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. In the meanwhile, do send a comment to us, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. You can also, if you have a show-related voicemail, you can give us a call 208-991-4783. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. This happened a few years ago in San Diego. My wife and I were walking around Ocean Beach and decided to stop into a little hole-in-the-wall Mexican place for some cheap tacos. As we were eating, this homeless guy stumbled in from the street. Normally, we wouldn't have paid attention because in Ocean Beach, this is a very normal occurrence. But this dude was ridiculously wasted and barely coherent. As he was shuffling over to make an order, we saw his face. It was me. No mistake. No confusion. He was a very disheveled, dirty, and hairier me, and in different clothes. My wife and I looked at each other like, are you seeing this? And I just kept staring at him, trying to convince my brain that it was an illusion. I have a few semi-distinctive features. I'm kind of tall, 6'3". I have big lips and a sharp nose. The guy had my exact face and build. He was struggling with getting money out of his pocket at the register, but eventually got his burrito and sat down directly facing us a few booths away. We got an even better look at him as he ate his food. It was pretty gross, because his mouth wasn't working right, probably because of the drugs. Another weird detail that I reflect upon is that I couldn't bring myself to talk to him. I'm usually very gregarious and never have problems striking up conversations. I wanted to get a picture of us together and ask him his name, but I was stuck there just staring at him. My wife and I both felt the discomfort and decided to leave. I'm still kicking myself for being such a chicken about it, but the experience freaked me out. I felt like I was in some Ebenezer Scrooge situation and I was being shown how I could have ended up had I made different decisions in life. This was around 12 years ago, and still haunts me to this day. I was at one of my relative's house, and was playing on the front yard with one of my cousins, female, who was around 8 years older than me. We were taking turns chasing each other, 
and were just running around. Their house was two stories high, with a terrace on top. My other cousin, male, five years older than me, was watching us and teasing from the terrace as we played. There was nobody else home, and both of them were kind of babysitting me. When it was my turn to chase her, she ran inside the house. In order to reach their terrace, one has to climb four flights of stairs, and most of the stairs were dimly lit. Now we were suddenly running inside, and my eyes were not fully adjusted to the darkness yet. My female cousin was already on the first floor when I was just reaching the first flight of stairs. And at that exact moment, I bumped head first into someone. I looked up to the person's face, and as I did so, I noticed two things. That person was the exact height of my cousin who was on the terrace, which made me assume it was him immediately. And two, the eyes were red. Not as in glowing red, but more of a could see blood vessels red. I was just a kid, so I didn't even mind to process how I could see the eyes in that darkness, but thinking about it now gives me goosebumps. Things get even weirder. I ask the person who he is, but he doesn't respond, and now is staring directly at my face. Confused, I said. Why are you messing with me, cousin? And in a deep voice, he said, I am not him. My female cousin probably heard me talking, so she came down somewhere middle of the second flight of stairs and asked me what I was doing. I asked her why he was standing there, and I complained that he was messing with me, since she was the oldest. She just said there was nobody standing there, and instead thought I was trying to be smart to catch her. You know, since we were chasing each other and all. Now, I got irritated and pushed the guy, but he didn't move at all. It felt like I was pushing a wall. I brushed it off and ran upstairs. I could hear my female cousin running towards the terrace, so I did the same. I almost got a heart attack when I saw my male cousin still on the terrace. I asked him why he was messing with me, and he said he was at the terrace all the time. Funny thing is that he couldn't have been lying, because there was only one way up and down those stairs, and I was at the stairs. I was 15 when this story happened. My grandfather had just passed away, and we were going to attend his final rituals. It's a common thing done in South Asia when someone passes away, where you do prayers for multiple days. Most of the time, kids aren't allowed to see any of this stuff because it's meant to be bad luck or something. So me and my cousin, who was around two years younger than me, just hung out. A thing you need to know about where my grandparents lived was that it was basically a forest. It was as rural as you could get to the point where animals would frequently wander in. So since we had nothing else to do, we would just play in the large expanse of land. One thing me and my cousin would love to do is play hide and seek. This time around, I was seeking. I checked the usual place, but I couldn't find the guy. So I went to the front of my grandma's house and yelled, I give up. As I was about to make my way into the house, I heard a laugh coming from the roof of the house. When I looked up, my cousin was in a crouched position. His hands were wrapped around his knees, and he was smiling at me. I yelled at him in our mother tongue, telling him that we aren't allowed up there, but he doesn't say anything, he just smiles with this slightly confused look. At this point, I start feeling oddly anxious, like my heart rate jumped to 110 or something. My cousin was still in that slightly crouched position, smiling. Then it hit me why I was freaking out. To this day, I can't explain it, but it was like instincts realized it before I did. 
We weren't allowed on the roof because one of my grandfather's workers fell from there in the 60s. To make sure this wouldn't happen again, they set up six feet walls on the roof sides to make sure people wouldn't fall. He was 13 and we were short. For him to be in that crouching position, he had to be well over seven feet. I started to feel more and more nauseated. Then I heard my cousin yell my name from inside the house. I see him pop his head out from the slightly open door. I was flipping shit. I didn't even look at the roof, I just ran into the house, basically tackling my real cousin. The next few days went without any event, and I kind of forgot about it. But I just had a dream about it last night, and I still have no idea how I didn't notice how tall the thing was. Looking back, I should have immediately noticed that my 5'2 cousin wasn't going to be able to peek his head out from there, much less crouch and be seen. I am a non-believer of all that is paranormal, as I feel anything has scientific reasoning behind it. I did, however, used to be a hardcore Catholic up until the age of 19. I am now 27. Nowadays, anything that has to do with religion or paranormal, I am extremely skeptical of because of my past. Anyway, I've lived in an apartment for about six years now with my son and his father. And yes, we're not religious. At all. However, the last few years, I've seen things out of the corner of my eyes, like white shadows. I keep telling myself, oh, they're just shadows of flies or mosquitoes, people walking by, etc. So I always brush them off. Two months ago, an event that keeps bothering me and honestly makes me tear up every time I think about it made me come to this conclusion tonight to make an account on Reddit because I know no one would believe me, especially my family. One night, I decided to lay down on my couch in the living room and just look at articles on my phone while the show Gypsy on Netflix played in the background. Mind you, a couple of minutes prior, my son's father decided to go outside and smoke a cigarette, which he acknowledged and told me he was doing so, since sometimes he'd go to the liquor store at the corner of our street, so he just wanted to let me know he was only going out to smoke. Well, five minutes later, and I can't even type this without tearing up, he comes back inside, looks at me like if I had done something wrong as he walks to the bedroom. To get to the bedroom in my apartment, you have to walk directly in front of the TV and across everything and everyone in the living room. The bedroom door is slightly to the left of me, and I see him through the door, looking through his dresser, like pushing through paperwork trying to find something, quickly pushing his dresser shut, and going into the bathroom and slamming it shut, and really hard. I yell, damn, hello, what happened? And I'm pissed because our kid is asleep, and I was mad he'd wake him up from slamming the bathroom door shut so hard. I keep looking at the bathroom, waiting for him to come out so I can give him shit about slamming the door. And the front door of the apartment opens 10 minutes later. My son's dad comes walking in, and I just couldn't breathe. I immediately looked over at the bathroom door, and I can see from the corners of it that the light is on inside, but the door is completely shut. I tell my son's dad if he can open the bathroom door, and he does. No one is inside, but he just goes to pee and then sits down in the living room when he's done. I didn't tell him about this until a week after it happened, and I haven't told anybody about this other than him because, come on, we all know why. But like I said earlier, weird things have gone on in my apartment, and I should mention that random things have ended up in random places, like my cell phone on top of my stove, my oven turning on by itself, my bathroom door closing shut.
I don't know if my apartment has become a vessel or something for interdimensional crossing, but I know that something is not right. I've had to drop my classes because I can't focus. I have the worst anxiety every day, and I always see a white shadow seemingly running across my living room, left and right. This is two separate experiences that come together to one big event. One day I was home alone with my mom, just hanging out in the living room and watching TV. My mom got a phone call and I watched her go upstairs, like I literally watched her go up the stairs. A couple minutes later, I went upstairs to ask her a question. She wasn't up there. I looked all around the house and eventually found her sitting on the porch, still on the phone. I asked her if she went upstairs. She looked at me like I was crazy and said she hadn't been upstairs all day. A couple weeks later, I was sitting on my bed using my laptop. My mom was getting ready for bed. I looked up and saw her standing in the doorway in a white nightgown. She sleeps in one just like it, and her hair was all messed up. She didn't say anything, she just looked at me, and I just looked back down at my laptop. And I looked back up, but she was gone. I thought she went to her room. I heard something in the bathroom, so I went to check it out, and she was right there in front of the mirror taking off her makeup with her hair still fixed up from earlier, and in her normal day clothes, no nightgown. I asked her how she changed so fast. She looked at me again like I was crazy. About a month later, my parents got in a car accident where the truck they were in flipped three and a half times, and my mom's side almost got T-boned by a semi-truck. According to some people, what I saw was my mom's doppelganger, and when someone sees a doppelganger, it means that something bad is going to happen to the person that the doppelganger looks like. I have had three glitch experiences in my life, none of which I have been able to come up with any explanation for. The first was when I was at university, so around 2000, and I was sitting alone in my flat, and I got a phone call from my father, who sounded quite cross. The conversation went something like this. Why didn't you tell your mother and I that you were back home? I'm not. Yes, you are. I just saw you walking up the high street. I'm honestly not. I'm here in Cambridge. I saw you. You were wearing your long coat and those big boots. I swear I wasn't. I'm here in my flat. I then did something that proved I was at my flat. I can't remember what, but whatever it was, both convinced and deeply confused my dad, as apparently the me he saw looked totally identical, and he slowed down the car and shouted my name, and the doppelganger turned and looked at him, and still, my father was sure it was me. The second also involved my parents, maybe a year or so later. My mobile rang, and the name showing was mom and dad. I answered the phone, and it was a very bad line. I said, Hello? And got a distorted reply. This is from memory and isn't verbatim. Hello? Who is this? I asked as the voice wasn't either of my parents. It's Manpreet. The voice said, Oh wow! Hello, how are you? I asked because Manpreet was the name of a boy that I was really good friends with when I was young, as his family lived right across the road from mine, but there was no reply. Are you at my parents' house? I asked, but with more static. Then the line went dead. I called my parents back, and when they answered, they said they had not called me at all and that they did not hear from Manpreet's family for about 10 years, and that there was nobody in their house but the two of them. The third one kind of breaks the rules because it involved me being hammered drunk, but I think it deserves mention. 
This was around the same time as the second story. I was in a nightclub. It was about 2 a.m. and I was very drunk. I was feeling a little maudlin because I was recently single and most of my friends had already gone home. So in a fit of foolish desperation, I messaged a friend of mine who I had loved dearly in a non-romantic sense. I vaguely remember texting something like, I think we should get married. We're such good friends and I love you loads. It was probably spelled much worse though. The next day I remembered doing this and called her to apologize and she was highly amused at what I'd done, but had to inform me that she'd never received the message. This was odd, as I'd selected her name from my contacts to send the message, not typed in the number, which I would have certainly got wrong. Then I remembered something that had happened prior to this. Let's go back two or three weeks. I was leaving my house in the early evening, and my phone rang and it was an unknown number. I answered it, and it was a male voice. Again, this is not verbatim, but it's about right. Hello? Hi. Who is this? Um, you called me. Yes, but I got a message from this number saying that you think you should marry me. That's odd. I haven't sent that. Well, I got it from this number, I've just called it straight back. Honestly, I haven't sent any message. We both awkwardly agreed that it must have been some sort of error with the phone system across the line. But the message he described sounded so much like the one I drunkenly sent weeks later. I have no idea what happened. My husband saw my doppelganger in our hallway last night. We live in an old farmhouse, and we have had many paranormal and unexplained spirits, noises, etc. Last night, I was in the bathtub. My husband came in the bathroom to wash his hands and went back out to do the laundry. He was in the laundry room and looked through the kitchen and saw what he thought was me in the hallway, buck naked. He called my name and said she turned her face towards him and gave a look like she didn't know who he was. Then she walked a step behind a column and our son came out from the same column from the opposite way. Our son asked who my husband was talking to and said that he didn't see me. My husband came into the bathroom where I was still in the tub. He made me swear that I hadn't left the tub. He was very freaked out, and he made us follow him from room to room the rest of the night and announce ourselves if we came into a room where he was. He had spoken to a medium a few months ago. She is coming Saturday to bless us and our home. She said she would like to try to see what the spirits are and try to release them. She also told me before to place black salt around our doorways and in the four corners of our home. So the medium came over. We'll call her M. She looked nervous when she got to our house. I'll list what she said. 1. She had been preparing all day and felt very uneasy. 2. Her watch stopped during the day. She was talking to me, my hubby, and our 12-year-old son. He is the one she said she was really worried about. She asked him more about what he had seen and I didn't know that he was seeing what he called black mist in the shape of a person. I had no idea, and I felt horrible about it. Our son is not much of a talker, or very emotional in general. M continued. Three. We have two demons. Four. She drew a rough image of our house and barn before she ever saw it. Five. She felt nauseous and had a headache. My son heard something and went upstairs to his room, which is really a master suite. He had a cross shadow box on his wall. He heard it fall and land about 15 feet away. It was in his room right across from his bathroom doorway and closet doorway. It landed face down in his closet. His closet is as large as a small room. He waved M up to his room, 
She went into the closet. She and Carson heard a growl and came back downstairs. She read Psalms 91 to us, and then she and our son went to work blessings in the house. She used sage, and he used salt in the corners of every room. She didn't have a lighter, so I gave her one, but it kept going out. Finally, I got her husband's torch. It's the kind where you hook on the small propane tank. It kept going out, and she seemed very freaked out about that. She had a lot to say when she walked around. 6. She said our boy's room, and especially closet, felt like the devil's den. That's an odd thing to say, since Carson's room is painted in red and white checkerboard. 7. Our spare bedroom, an early 30s man, committed suicide in the room. 8. Our third bedroom, she said there's a woman's spirit in it. 9. Our pink bedroom had children's footprints that showed in the wood. We have no small children. I noticed it looked like it had some sticky spots on the floor, but I'm not sure where they came from. 10. Our other spare bedroom has a little short door to an attic. She was scared. She didn't explain why, but she was freaked out. She also used holy oil on each of us and prayed over us. She told us that if it did not help, she would get a priest involved for us. She talked to our son and asked if he had ever used a Ouija board. She saw that in the visions that she has, but it was not our son. We have had multiple talks about that, and we like scary movies, although we have not watched anything since we moved in. She also demanded that we get rid of some of our furniture that was left in our house when we moved in. Burn it if we can. There are a couple of dressers, a chest, an antique sewing machine, and a few other pieces of furniture. I had to go drive for Uber that night. When I got home about 4 a.m., my son was sleeping on the sofa. He likes to know that I am home, so I woke him up and kissed his forehead. I told him that I was home, and I asked if anything happened, since he usually sleeps in his room. He said yes, and I asked him if he wanted to talk about it now or in the morning. He said the morning. I should have mentioned it, but my son is actually my stepson, my husband's son. He has lived with us since he was seven, and his mom doesn't really have anything to do with him anymore. She lives states away and hasn't called or had any contact with him in over four years, so he's my son. The next morning, he had football practice. He goes to a private coach twice a week. Even though I was tired, I went with him. We wanted to wait until after to find out what happened. My husband and I were watching from the car, and as soon as it was over, he got in the car by himself. He looked really upset. I asked him what was wrong, and he said nothing. Then he agreed to talk about it later. He started crying. He said that last night he had seen his three little half-siblings in his room. He said that they were the same age as when he saw them last. He knew they were not real. He also said that when he was at practice, he kept seeing a shadow figure standing behind his coach. He said it seemed threatening, like it wanted to hurt his coach. Now he is seeing this thing when he's not at our house, out in the daylight, on a beautiful spring day. We get home and my husband has to leave for work. We start trying to move a corner bookshelf in our dining room that was there when we moved in. It had glass, so we removed it, and we thought it would be lightweight, so my son and I could get it out to the shed where it could be taken away by the farmhands who work the property. It was not light. So I get on top of the chair since I saw a piece of paper at the top. There is also a small statue of a Native American with horns and some animal skin with hair. Not sure if it was real or fake. I didn't touch it and I took a picture of it and sent it to M. Her response was, oh hell. She thinks previous tenants used that. My son and I burned it in the backyard. He said he had something else like that, but something scarier in one of the sheds on our property. Fortunately, that shed had been emptied. We finally went back inside and I salted and prayed over the corner. Then last night, 
My son went to take a shower. He said that when he got out, his mom and his siblings were sitting on his bed. He knew they were not real, so he prayed to have God's protection. Then he got dressed quickly and ran downstairs to me. My son slept on the sofa last night. My husband and he got the clothes that he needed for today and camped him out in the living room. My plan is to continue to get all of the old furniture removed and do the sage cleansing a few more times where things happen, like in our son's room. The Grinning Man A story written by SSA89 I have worked as a paranormal investigator for close to 30 years. I always had believed there was more to our world than what most think. Like the submerged section of an iceberg, there is something under our choppy waters of regular existence. I suppose there is little other reason to take this job other than that belief. It certainly isn't for the money or respect. But I would be lying if I said my early years in this profession didn't test my faith in the existence of the paranormal world. For the first four years of my work, I found nothing. No evidence of even a single paranormal phenomenon in any of the cases I took. There were hordes of unconfirmable ghost sightings, hauntings that were explained away by natural phenomenon and even the odd prankster or two. I felt like I was floundering. I started to wonder if I had followed a road that led to nowhere. My destination, nothing but a hazy mirage perpetually on the horizon. That was until I took a case in 1997. My most haunting case, still to this day. The case of the grinning man. Do you mind if I record this interview? I asked. Uh, no, that's okay. Audrey said. We were in the living room of our small home. Audrey sat on the sofa across from me, a 35-year-old woman that looked closer to 50. She was small, hunched over, as if a weight pressed on her shoulders. I placed the tape recorder on the coffee table and pressed the record button. Inside, the cassette tape whirred to life. Audrey, Thank you for calling me to investigate your problem. I want you to know I'll take your claim seriously and investigate them as such. Whatever the outcome may be, if the phenomenon you are experiencing is paranormal or natural, I'll seek to find out the truth the best I can. Thank you. Please, start from the beginning. She sighed and brushed some stray frazzled hair behind her ear with one hand. I could see she was at her wit's end. Her face bore deep wrinkles beyond her age, her eyes contained within dark purple sockets, and her nails chewed away to ragged edges. Whatever she was experiencing, paranormal or not, was certainly real to her. Okay, she began. I, I guess it all started when I was a baby. That far back? Yes, my first memories are of seeing him. Him? What I call the grinning man. She shuddered when she said it. The thing that's been haunting me my entire life. I can even remember him as a baby. It's burned into my memory, 
He dresses like someone from the 40s or 50s with a tan trench coat and black fedora. I was laying in my crib when I first recall seeing him. He gripped the crib's bars while he peered at me through them, looming over a little helpless me like an ominous mountain just thinking of it turns my stomach. And he was grinning at you? Yes, like he always is. Have you ever heard people describe a psychopath's grin? Where their smile is there and looks friendly enough. But if you look closely, you can see their eyes hold nothing? I think I understand. His smile is like that. It's like he has reptilian eyes. Unseeing, cold, predatory, evil. Must have had a quite an impact on you considering you remember from that far back. Has he been cropping up your entire life? Yes, it's sporadic. Sometimes I'll go years without seeing him. Other times I'll see him multiple times a month. What's a typical encounter like? Well, he appears out of nowhere. Then he stands as still as a statue and watches me with that sick grin of his plastered on his face. He could show up anywhere at any time, among the trees as I walk through the park, from a random house's window as I walk down the street, the shadows of my own home when I get a glass of water in the middle of the night. Does this entity ever say or do anything? No. Always silent. Always unmoving. Just tracking me with his eyes. Interesting. Do you ever feel anything when you see this entity? Yes. An intense sense of dread and tightness in the chest. Almost like he's reaching out with imaginary brooding fingers to squeeze my heart. And sometimes, when I see him, something terrible happens soon after. You mean that a sighting of the grinning man is a precursor to a traumatic event? Yes, not all the time, but enough that when I see him my nerves will be shot. And I'll walk around with this dark cloud weighing on me as I wait for the worst to happen. Could you give me an example? Audrey sighed, and tears swelled at the corner of her eyes. She averted her gaze and looked out the window. If, if it's too difficult, you don't have to. No, it's okay. She reached for the tissue box on the coffee table, took a couple, sniffled, and dabbed her eyes. The worst incident was in 1993. I had been married for three years and had just given birth to our first child. He was four months old at the time. I was back at work by then and I was coming home very late one evening. The roads were dead. A bad storm had just passed through and I still remember the long colorful glows from the traffic lights and street lamps across the wet roads. I came to a stop at a red. I just happened to glance to my right. He was there, half covered in shadows. He stood on the pavement by the crosswalk, the walk signal glowing green as if he had meant to cross. That grin, he had sunk my heart as if it had turned to stone. I don't know exactly how long I stayed there, locked in his gaze. But when my light turned green again, I got out of there as fast as I could. When I looked in the rear view, I saw his silhouette in the street, watching me as I fled. I knew I'd struggled to sleep that night. I was shaking and felt like throwing up. I had to take a Valium, and that helped. 
I plopped into bed and passed out more than fell asleep. I was awoken by my husband frantically shaking me in the morning. His face was pale, a look of sheer terror filled panic I had never seen before. Our son had passed away in the night. The death was ruled a Sid's case. I sat in silence, giving Audrey a moment as she let her emotions out. At the time, I wasn't sure what to think. Her story was unique, far from the standard ghostly apparitions others saw. I was intrigued. I did wonder if it was a mental condition. I had encountered a schizophrenic who had believed their hallucinations were a result of paranormal phenomena on a previous case, though their condition had been more apparent even to me. If Audrey was ill, it was not obvious. Yes, I have. I had kept the grinning man a secret my entire life. After all, who would believe me? I even kept it from my husband. But after our son died, I had to tell him. I don't know why, but I just did. He was obviously concerned for me, my mental health. He wanted me to see a therapist. I refused at first. We had a lot of fights about it, and eventually he forced me to go see one. What did they say? Well, I was put through the ringer. Eventually, I was diagnosed with psychosis. I was put on meds, went to therapy twice a week, and none of it helped. He would still show up. Eventually, I quit the meds, quit the therapy, waste of time and money as far as I was concerned. But my husband thought different. He didn't like that I had quit all of it, and our marriage kind of fell apart from there. But... I was, still am, convinced what I was experiencing is real. That's why I came to you. I figured someone like you would at least take my story seriously. I nodded. I do. And there's another reason I sought you out. Please. Well, I, I need help. I've been seeing the Grinning Man a lot more lately. He's been appearing more frequently than ever before. How often? Every few nights for the past two or three months. He only shows up at night now, usually outside my bedroom window. And I did see him in the hallway last week. I never used to sleep with my bedroom door closed, but I do now. I don't know if I could take it much longer. My nerves are shot. Dread suffocates my chest all the time. I think something terrible is going to happen soon. I'm scared of what he might do to me. But you could prove it, right? You could prove he's real. You can help me get rid of it, right? I will try, Audrey. I'll try. After the interview, I tested her home for electromagnetic fields. Strong EMFs can often be responsible for hallucinations of app apparitions, or that creepy feeling that elicits goosebumps on the back of your neck. It often causes people to believe they are experiencing a haunting. In reality, it's usually just poor electrical wiring, or old and dirty wall sockets bleeding electricity into the environment. Those EMFs can mess with people's senses. Though Audrey's sightings of the Grinning Man were not tied to a particular location, I figured EMFs may be responsible for her latest string of sightings that occurred primarily in her bedroom. But after a sweep of the house, I detected nothing abnormal. I then set up a camera on a tripod in her bedroom. It sat beside the head of the bed and had a complete shot of her room, including the window on the opposite wall and the door on the right that led into the hallway, both places she had seen the grinning man previously. I showed her how to record and instructed her to do so when she went to bed. 
I also gave her a nightlight to plug into an outlet so that the camera could see. Night vision and thermal imaging cameras were well out of my budget back then. I swung by her house the next two mornings to collect and review the tape. Those nights were uneventful. On the third night, I got a frenzied call from Audrey. The ringing jarred me awake. The clock on my nightstand read 2.08 a.m. I trudged to the phone, and as soon as I answered, Audrey's frantic voice came over the line. He was here, she cried. He was here. He tried to hurt me. I arrived at Audrey's a little over half an hour later. She paced back and forth in the living room, a neglected cigarette burning in her hand, the ash tip growing long and pale as bone. She muttered one thing over and over. No escape. No escape. No escape. It took a minute to calm her down. At first, she looked right through me as if I wasn't there. Her eyes distant and fear-stricken as she continued to mutter, Can't escape! until the words burned in my ears. I eventually ushered her into the kitchen and sat her down. I found some cocoa in the cupboards and made her a warm cup. It seemed to help a little. Her trembling stopped. I'm going to watch the tape, I said. Do you want to watch it with me? She shook her head adamantly. She waited in the kitchen while I watched. She had a VCR player hooked up to a CRT television in her living room. I sat on the edge of the coffee table, rather than the sofa, for a closer view. I inserted the tape and the TV came to life. With the view of Audrey's room bathed in dim orange from the nightlight, and the window at the far end shined with a pale glow from the moon. The footage wasn't great, being comparatively rudimentary for what we have today. The picture quality was grainy and sometimes wavered in the way those VCR tapes did. But it was enough to see what I needed to. I fast forwarded the tape until the text on the bottom right corner read 1.30 a.m. I sat with a pen and notepad in hand, and I still have my notes from what I saw on the tape. 1.30 a.m. Audrey asleep in bed, nothing untoward. 1.35 a.m. Audrey becoming visibly restless, flipping and turning violently in her sleep. 1.38 a.m. Audrey settled. 1.40 a.m. Dark figure crossed window on opposite wall. 1.42 a.m. Dark figure crossed window again in opposite direction. 1.44 a.m. Dark figure standing in front of window. Figure looks like a person, possibly wearing a hat. Figure too dark to make out features. 1.46 a.m. Static intermittently breaking up the picture. Figure still standing at the window. 1.50 a.m. The figure disappeared, did not walk or move away, simply vanished. 1.51 a.m. Audrey becoming restless again. 1.52 a.m. Bedroom door opened. That was the last note I took. My heart was pounding in my ears by this point. A few seconds after the door had opened, seemingly by itself, the man appeared from the darkness in the hallway, like a demon emerging from the depths of hell. I dropped my notepad and gawked at the television screen. Even through the grainy footage and the worsening bursts of static, I could make out the grin plastered across the figure's face. The grinning man. The nightlight suddenly went out and the screen went black. 
It took a few moments for the lens to adjust to the dimmer moonlight coming through the window, and when it did, the grinning man was a dark silhouette just inside the doorway. I stood and approached the television, bent over at the waist, face inches from the screen to get a closer look. The tape wavered badly, making everything unrecognizable. When the picture cleared, the grinning man had teleported from the doorway to the bedside, just in front of the camera. He peered down at Audrey. My heartbeat thumped steadily in my ears. The picture wavered again for longer. When it steadied, the gritty man had his arms extended downward toward Audrey. She was now kicking and thrashing in bed. The grinning man's hands appearing to be clasped around her throat. The blanket was flung from the bed suddenly, a big dark cloud moving across the screen. Audrey thrashed, and the grinning man held on. The moonlight glanced off his teeth, making that diabolic grin a glimmering silver blemish at the base of his darkened face. Like his grin, his eyes shined palely with manic glee. A prolonged burst of static. I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding. The picture came back, the nightlight was on, and Audrey sat upright in bed, grasping at her neck. The grinning man was gone. I felt something in the air then, heavy, like humidity, a powerful feeling that pervaded the house. A feeling of anger. The VCR tape paused by itself, then began to rewind. The tape whined frantically inside the player with a high pitch. The picture on the screen sheared then went black. Smoke seeped from the vents of the player and around the edges of the opening flap. I mashed the eject button hoping to save the tape, but the crinkling noise that sounded like crumpling cellophane left me with little confidence. The flap turned back and the tape flew out as if shot from a cannon. The mass of cracked casing and wadded tangled tape hit me in the chest and fell to the floor. The television flew off the cabinet suddenly, pushed from an unseen force, and landed before my feet with the screen shattering. Audrey came in from the kitchen alarmed. She glanced at the TV, laying busted on the floor and the tape next to it, and then at me. What happened? He, he's real, I said breathlessly. I saw it. On the tape. He's real. Perhaps it was foolish to believe simply leaving the home would have helped. But it was the only thing I could think to do. I took Audrey to a nearby motel and booked us into neighboring rooms. I sat on the edge of my bed at a loss. I had completely underestimated what we were dealing with until watching that tape. I wasn't even sure the entity was real. But not only was it real, it, it was dangerous. I phoned a close acquaintance, one that wasn't so happy to be woken up at three in the morning, who worked for another paranormal investigation team. He was happy to help once I explained the seriousness of the situation. He gave me the number of a good medium who could help give a reading, perhaps to identify what we were dealing with. I was also hoping she might have known methods to banish the entity from Audrey's life, if it were at all possible. I decided to call the medium first thing in the morning, but it would be too late for her to do anything by then. I lay down on the bed, my thoughts swimming in a fuzzy haze of fatigue and the come down of an adrenaline spike. I realized that for the first time with true conviction, I had encountered something under the surface of the normal world, 
something sinister hiding in those deep and dark murky waters below. You can live your life pretending that world is not real. Many do, and sure, chances are, you'll never be affected by it. But you should know, that world is real, and it's there, lurking in the darkest of shadows, around us. With some difficulty, I eventually fell asleep. The short doze from three to dawn was restless. I had a nightmare. I was drowning in black sludge as dark as the starless night sky above me. My arms and legs struggled through thick and oily liquid as I fought to keep my head above the surface. My breath cut short and my chest squeezed tight. Panic flooded in through every pore on my body as the presence of evil prickled my skin. And then, darkness. I awoke to sunlight glowing around the edges of the grimy motel curtain. The bed sheets were scrunched up mess, and my blanket lay strewn across the floor. With the sick feeling creeping up in my gut, I realized how the scene closely mirrored what I saw in the aftermath of the attack on Audrey. I rushed out of my room to Audrey's next door. She didn't answer the first few knocks, so I knocked louder. No answer. I called her name and pounded on the door. Still, no answer. I rushed to the motel's front desk, convincing them to let me into the room. When we entered, Audrey was in the bed, her face pale, poked out from the blanket. Her lips were blue, her eyes vacant and lifeless, stared at nothing. My heart plummeted. She was dead. I dream of that morning often, the moment we walked into that godforsaken room to see Audrey drained of life. I'll never forget that. The case has stuck with me all these years. I've pored over the details many times. I relive my actions and question if there was more I could have done. I try not to blame myself. I know it's not healthy. But I just can't lift the weight of guilt that still sits on my shoulders. Or perhaps it's my liver that takes the brunt. Fact is, as I see it, she came to me for help, and I did not do enough. I wish I could tell you I got revenge on this thing, that I tracked the entity down and vanquished it like a hero at the end of a Hollywood action movie. But life doesn't tend to work like that. Besides, my experience with Audrey and that close brush I had in the dingy motel room, I've yet to cross the path of the grinning man ever again. But that's the nature of this line of work. Things don't get wrapped up and topped off with a neatly tied bow. We deal with things that are on the edge, things that straddle the line between the world we know and the one we don't. Things are hazy, transient, and often unknowable. Neat resolutions don't find their way to us easily. I can tell you that Audrey's death was eventually ruled a case of sudden arrhythmic death syndrome, or SADS, as you can probably guess. I have some doubts that that was all there was to it. I still called the medium. We met a couple weeks after Audrey's passing. We went to the motel and booked the same room Audrey had died in. The worker at the desk was certainly curious as to why I insisted on that room, but I refused to say. The medium's face drained of color the second she stepped inside. She walked around the room in silence for ten minutes. She moved slowly.
think deep as she tapped into a strange, ominous world. Can't say I envy her talents. Something incredibly powerful, she eventually said. It's not here now, but I can still feel its vestiges. How long ago did this happen? A little over two weeks. A grave expression crossed the medium's face. Yes, very powerful. Do you know what the entity is? Not precisely, but I can say that its soul is black and twisted. That thing has a soul? All intelligent forces do. And what do you mean by black and twisted? I mean the entity is a corrupted agent of death itself. I was speechless for a moment as the weight of her words robbed me of breath. The drip coming from the sink in the bathroom was the only thing to break the crushing silence. What can we do about it? I asked. The medium smiled wistfully at my naivete, I assume. I was young and inexperienced and ready for a fight. She knew that and her expression grew dark as she took one last look over the room. Not a thing, she said. Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we do get started, I do want to let you know this program is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners, and you can support the show at support.greatdetectives.net, or you can also uh, become a monthly supporter at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, we introduce our second straight new story. And unlike our previous episode, uh, this is actually the first episode of the uh, series uh, with the titular uh, character in it. However, this was far from his mystery debut. This series was descended from the Mole Mystery Theater. One of the great uh, mystery anthology series of the World War II and uh, the immediate era afterwards. The series moved to CBS and with the influence of Anne and Frank Hummert, best known for producing soap operas, as well as the longtime success, or should say long-running success, melodrama detective series, Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, the series began to uh, focus on the character of Hearthstone of the Death Squad, eventually becoming the sole feature of the series. So this 1951 uh, launch came after essentially three years of being the uh, lead character on the series anyway. The series starred Alfred Shirley, who is probably best known for playing Dr. Watson opposite John Stanley's Holmes in the first season of uh, New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes for Mutual after uh, Nigel Bruce left and the series moved back to New York. Anyway, here's the first episode of the series. From August 30th of 1951, here's the unheated murder case. <laughs> CBS Radio again presents the famous Hearthstone of the Death Squad. 
implacable manhunter of the Metropolitan Police in one of his greatest investigations, entitled The Unheeded Warning Murder Case, with Ronald Long as Elliot Lindsay and Florence Williams as Della Parker. <laughs> Inspector Hearthstone of the Death Squad in the unheeded warning murder case. The scene opens in the front office of the Lindsay Messenger Service, whose business is the delivery of messages and small parcels. A pretty girl is seated at a desk. She looks up, surprised, as the door opens, and a young man, obviously excited, enters. The girl is Della Parker. The young man is Phil Richards, a newspaper reporter, Della's fiancé. And we hear Della say the words that lead to violence and murder. Oh, Phil, this is a surprise. What are you doing here? Della, quick. Put on your hat. You've got to get out of this place. Oh, you sound as dramatic as one of your stories in the paper, Phil. I've come to warn you, Della. Well, all right, I'm warned, but what about? Hurry, Della. I'll tell you on the way out. Oh, you sound awfully silly, Phil, but I love you anyway. Della, please be serious. You're in real danger here. Well, what on earth are you talking about? This place. The Lindsay Messenger Service isn't what you think it is. Oh, are you trying to kid me, Phil? Certainly I'm not. This place isn't a messenger service at all. It's the front for one of the worst criminal operations in New York. Oh, don't be silly. My city editor, Martin Bayer, just gave me the lowdown on what goes on in this well, place. What goes on here? He's ready to blow the whole dirty business wide open. And when he does, one of the biggest stories of crime and murder the paper has ever printed will flash across the front page and rock the town. Oh, Phil, you talk like a scene from a 10, 20, 30 melodrama. All right, don't listen to me, Della. Treat me like an idiot, but whatever you do, come with me now. Quit this job. Get away from this place before something happens to you. If you think I'm going to give up a job paying a hundred dollars a week because of some wild idea born in a newspaper office, well, I won't do it. It's stupid. If you want to know, I'm going to keep this job until long after we're married. It's no wild idea, and Martin Bayard is not the kind of city editor who chases rainbows. I order you, Della, to leave here now. You order me, do you? Well, you can't order me to do anything. I didn't know I was marrying a fool. But don't say I didn't warn you. What a stubborn imbecile you are. Goodbye. Trouble is, you've been reading too many detective stories. Guess he didn't hear that. Anyway, nothing's happened but a kiss won't cure tonight. Hi, beautiful. Where's your boss? If you mean Mr. Lindsay, he's in his office. And don't call me beautiful. Who shall I tell Mr. Lindsay wants to see him? You're telling him nothing, baby. I'm going in there. That's his door, ain't it? But you can't see Mr. Lindsay without being announced. No, get out of my way. I'm going but in. You, you stay right here, kid. Well, Lindsay, who are you? And what's your business? So you don't know Bash Kegel, eh? Try something new, Lindsay. I repeat, I don't know you. Well, we're going to get acquainted fast, Lindsay. I'm the Bash Kegel you're trying to throw to the cops. And I just dropped by to tell you. One more chip and I'll kill you. I've got my foot on an alarm bell that will bring everybody in this office here. Now get this. Bash Kegel, if that's your name. I don't know you. I've never seen you. You've got the wrong idea somewhere. Any more of that, Lindsay, and I'll kill you right now. When I mentioned the alarm bell to you, I didn't mention this gun in my hand. Now leave. Get out! So that's it, huh? Okay, I'll leave. But on my way out, I'll count that dame on the dome. The one who tried to keep me out of here. No, you won't leave by that door. You'll leave through this back door right here. Now move. Mr. Lindsay, what were those shots? Oh, I don't know, Della. They came from the back hallway. I look out there. I'll open the door. Oh, that man's been murdered. The man who forced his way into your office. Oh, how terrible. I'll call the police, Stella. <laughs> Once again, the steely, cold hearthstone of the Delft Squad and his assistant detective Sam Cook 
find themselves on the scene of a strange and puzzling murder. And we hear Inspector Hearthstone with Della Parker and her employer, Mr. Lindsay, as he says, So, your story, Mr. Lindsay, is that a man you had never seen before forced his way into your office, threatened to kill you, left by the back door which you had closed upon him, and was shot down in this hallway about ten feet from the door of this office. I'm sure he was insane, Inspector Hearthstone. He forced his way into my office. That's just what happened, Inspector. I'm Della Parker, Mr. Lindsay's confidential secretary. The man rushed in with a mad look in his eyes, wouldn't let me announce him, pushed me aside, and forced his way into Mr. Lindsay's office and slammed the door. So you were not in Mr. Lindsay's office while this man was talking to him? No, Della was outside in the reception room. But you see, Inspector Hearthstone, she confirms my story exactly. So I should expect to be your secretary, Mr. Lindsay. Confirming employer's story is part of a secretary's job. But I wonder, will she confirm whatever explanation you make of that forty-five caliber gun on your desk? A gun? Oh, well, Mr. Lindsay usually keeps that in his safe. I have no idea how it got there, Inspector. I used it to frighten the man away, Inspector. Remember, he was threatening to kill me. Why? I don't know. Detective Cook, Sam, hand me that gun, please. Sure, Inspector. Hmm. I see it hasn't been fired. Not much evidence, is there, Inspector Hearthstone? A gun that hasn't been fired? And the body of a man out there I've never set eyes on before. I wonder who he was. I can tell you, Mr. Lindsay. His name is Bash Cagle. And his business is that of a dope peddler. What? And your business is that of a messenger and parcel delivery service. Oh, how dreadful. What's dreadful, Della? Well, she may be formulating the idea, Mr. Lindsay... But a parcel delivery service would be an excellent way to distribute dope. But we'll drop that for the moment. Inspector Hearthstone, this excited girl is putting ideas into your mind. She hasn't the haziest idea of what this business is. Perhaps you should find a less excitable secretary, Mr. Lindsay. Probably safer. Della. Oh, Della, I was afraid it was you. Oh, no, darling, I'm so frightened. What's this? Bill Richards from the Evening Star, Inspector Hearthstone. Oh, now I recall him, Detective Cook. Hello, Phil. What brings you here? I came to cover the story and to get Della out of here, Inspector Hearthstone. Phil and I are to be married, Inspector. Oh, Phil, I should have listened to you this morning. This morning? Were you here before this murder occurred, Phil? Yes, about an hour before, Inspector I... Hearthstone. Looks like this guy gets in early, Inspector. Covers a murder story before the murder comes off. Fast work, Phil. That's a point, Sam. Why were you here this morning, Phil? He came to warn me, Inspector Hearthstone. That's it, Inspector. I had a tip from my city editor, Martin Bayard, that he was ready to blow this Lindsay Messenger Service outfit to the sky. Said he just about had the goods that it was the cover for a big crime ring. What kind of ring, Bill, Phil? Well, Bayard didn't tell me. He's a pretty secretive sort of a guy until he gets a story all lined up and tied together. But believe me, he's got one, or he wouldn't be saying anything. Phil came here terribly upset, Inspector Hearthstone, to have me leave my job, and I was silly enough to laugh at him. I called it melodrama. Phil, get your city editor, Martin Bayard, to the phone for me. Okay, Inspector. Park Row 8, 9970, and be quick. Hello, Star Office. This is Phil Richards. Put me on to Bayard at the city desk. What? Well, that's impossible. When? Wait. Let me tell this to Inspector Hearthstone. Listen, Inspector. Martin Bayard was shot down by a machine gun fire. What? They got him just as he was stepping into a lunchroom behind the newspaper office less than five minutes ago. So Bayard's story on the Lindsay Messenger Service was stopped by the hand of death. And I think I've got the answer, Inspector Hearthstone. This man, Lindsay, here, undoubtedly overheard me warning Della this morning and tipped his mob to bump off Bayer. It could be, Phil. Now, Lindsay. I didn't overhear anything, Inspector Hearthstone. I didn't even know this reporter was in here talking to Della. It's ridiculous. And why, in the name of heaven, should I want the city editor of the Evening Star murdered? As the evidence in this case unfolds itself, the answer to that question may be revealed, Lindsay. In the meanwhile, let's go back to the murdered dope peddler in the hall, Bash Cagle. 
His body, at least, is on these premises. May I point out to you, Inspector Hearthstone, that there is only a single set of footprints on the floor leading from this office to his body, his footsteps, and no others? No, you needn't, Lindsay. I noted that interesting fact myself. That's why I didn't approach the body. Well, that makes it pretty clear, doesn't it, that I didn't follow him down the hallway and kill him? Unless there's some very clever trick that I haven't caught on to as yet. Well, nobody ever goes down that hall. That is, except very seldom. The floor was waxed this morning. The only person walking over it was the murdered man. Hmm, so it seems. Now, tell me, Mr. Lindsay, did you use the phone after the murder? Only to call the police, Inspector Halfstone. Isn't that true, Della? Well, I don't know, Mr. Lindsay. That is... That is what, Della? Well, I'm sure, Inspector Halfstone, that Mr. Lindsay did not use the phone. Detective Cook, Sam, what did you find out from the elevator man? He says he brought two tough-looking characters up here, Inspector, but they never came down with him. If this is only the third floor, it'd be a cinch to get away down the stairs. Very well. And... Sam... There's a man looking out of the back office near Bash Cagle's body. I think he wants to talk to me. What do you know? Okay, I'll get him. Come on, mister. The inspector wants you. Certainly, officer. I've got a note for the inspector. You won't get anything out of him, Inspector Hearthstone. He's only the man who handles the parcels, Henry Jones. Oh, thank you, Lindsay. But I'll find out for myself. Here you are, Inspector Hearthstone. Your name is Henry Jones? What's your story? No story at all, Inspector Hearthstone. I just wanted to give you this note that I found. Oh, thanks, Mr. Jones. I'll look at it. What's in that note, Jones? Nothing of immediate interest to you, Lindsay. I think I take the point, Mr. Jones. We'll arrange it just as this note suggests. Sam, read this note. I think it's a trick, Inspector Hearthstone. I'm not so sure, Sam. Come on, let's go back to headquarters. Back to headquarters, Inspector, with everything hanging in the air? I don't catch you on. Come on, Sam. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Lindsay, for your help. I shall see you later. After your establishment has been gone over with a fine-tooth comb. Searched? What? And if you're interested in what I'm looking for, it's dope, narcotics, drugs. Goodbye. What about me and Della, Inspector Hearthstone? Oh, write your story for the newspaper, Phil, about this murder and about the killing of your city editor, Martin Bayard. Then look after your fiance. I think she may be ready now to stop laughing at your warnings. This note from that guy, Henry Jones, looks tricky to me, Inspector Hearthstone. It says, Can I see you at police headquarters? Have the evidence you want. Afraid to talk here. I'm the party who was given Bayard, city editor of the Evening Star, the lowdown. Henry Jones. Mm, the note can be a trick, Sam. Or it can be legitimate. When we talk to Henry Jones, we'll soon find out. My hunches will get nothing. <laughs> And Detective Sam Cooke was right. For while he and Inspector Hearthstone are on their way back to headquarters, this scene takes place with Henry Jones in his employer's office. We hear Mr. Lindsay, the employer, saying, You'll tell me what that note you wrote to Hearthstone was, Jones, or you're out of a job. It's got nothing to do with you, Mr. Lindsay, believe me. Were you by any chance making a date to talk to Hearthstone outside of this office? Where you could talk and talk and talk? Feed him a lot of eyewash about what you think goes on here. No, I'm not meeting that cop anywhere. Never had such an idea. That's the phone ringing in your office, Jones. Go answer it and then come back here. All right. I'll be right back, Mr. Lindsay. Hello? Hello? What is this? What are you doing? No! No, don't! Don't kill me! Look! Uh. Another mystery high spot on your CBS radio roster, formerly at this time, is the lineup. The lineup taking you behind the scenes into police cases and authentic police methods 
brings you stories of troubled human beings on both sides of the law. Exciting manhunts colored only by reality itself. From now on, the lineup will be heard Wednesday evening over most of these same CBS radio stations. And now, back to Hearthstone of the Death Squad and the unheeded warning murder case. When sudden murder strikes in the offices of the Elliot Lindsay Messenger Service, Inspector Hearthstone recognizes the victim as Bash Cagle, a notorious dope peddler. And he looks with suspicion upon Elliot Lindsay, especially when Phil Richards, a newspaper reporter, in love with Lindsay's beautiful secretary, Della Parker, tells Inspector Hearthstone that his city editor, Martin Bayard, has information that the Lindsay Messenger Service is being used to distribute dope. Then, Martin Bayard is murdered, and a note is delivered to Hearthstone from Henry Jones, a clerk in Elliot Lindsay's office, saying he has the evidence that will point out the murderer. Now it is a short time later. The scene is police headquarters, and we hear Inspector Hearthstone saying to Detective Sam Cook, Well, Henry Jones should be here any minute now, Sam. I still say the guy's a phony. Uh, Inspector Hearthstone speaking. Inspector Hearthstone. This is Elliot Lindsay. Another murder has been committed here in my office. The man, Henry Jones, who gave you that note has been shot, stone dead. A couple of policemen are here already, but I thought I'd better phone you myself. Put one of those policemen on the line, Lindsay. Uh, Officer, Inspector Hearthstone wants to speak to you. This is Officer Kenny, Inspector. Take Elliot Lindsay, head of Lindsay Messenger Service, in custody, officer. Bring him in handcuffed. Have the offices surrounded so nobody can get in or out and act at once. Goodbye. That's the third guy to go, Inspector. Yes, and if we're not careful, Sam, it won't be the last. Well, Sam, see if you can reach Phil Edwards, Richards at his uh, newspaper. Tell him I want to see him. Tell him to hurry over here. Well, that's I... a coincidence. I had a flash you'd want me, Inspector Hearthstone, so here I am. Oh, splendid, Phil. I see you brought Della with you. Oh, it was dreadful, Inspector. Phil and I hadn't even left the Lindsay offices when that poor, harmless old man, Henry Jones, was killed. He was in Lindsay's office, Inspector. Murdered in Lindsay's office? No, not killed there, but I heard them quarreling to Inspector Hearthstone in Mr. Lindsay's office. And then Henry Jones went to answer his phone, and he was shot in his own little cubby hole. It's a cinch Lindsay did it, Inspector. Now, Della... Tell Inspector Hearthstone what you told me about Lindsay's phone call before my city editor was killed. Well, don't hold back. There's nothing to be afraid of, Della. Well, I heard Mr. Lindsay on the phone calling somebody this morning after the first murder. And he said Phil City Editor Martin Bayard usually ran out for a sandwich at a lunch counter behind the newspaper office at about 2 o'clock every day. So there you are, Inspector. There's your case. It seems that way, Phil. But every indication is that Lindsay was not working alone. The dope racket embraces many men, many killers. I want them all. That's what my murdered city editor told me, Inspector. And by the way, I went through his private file and found one very peculiar thing. Phil, isn't it enough that three people have been killed already for talking without your taking a chance? Oh, so please get out of this case. I'm frightened, terribly frightened for you. Well... I'm a newspaper reporter, Della. I write what I see and I tell the police what I know. Please, Phil, I'm so frightened. You, you must take care of me. Why, with all those people being killed from that horrible Lindsay Messenger Service office, I'm afraid to go home. I, I know somebody will kill me. I, I'll sit up all night. I won't go to bed. Oh, easy, sweetheart. I've thought of that myself. So I've told my mother you'll stay with her until this is over. Oh, Phil, that's just what I hoped you'd say. Your mother's a darling. Uh, let me ask you, Phil... Did you bring those notes you took from your murdered city editor's private file with you? No, but I can get them, Inspector Hearthstone. Mm -hmm. After I've taken Della to my mother's, I'll go back to the newspaper and pick them up. I'll bring them to you then. Is that all right? So wouldn't it be quicker if we passed by the newspaper office on our way to your mother's? And you could get those papers then, and as soon as you've left me at mother's, and take a taxi and be back here in a few minutes? Oh, that's an idea, Della. I'll be back, Inspector Hearthstone, that way before ten. Excellent, Phil. Uh, you and Della had better run along now. Go through the door at the left. Come on, Della. See you about ten, Inspector Hearthstone. Bye. Bye. Yes, come in. 
I've got that man Lindsay outside, Inspector Hearthstone. You want him up here now? Yes, Officer Kinney. Bring him in. I'll go with you, Kinney, and get him myself. No, no, Sam. Let Kinney get him. And you hurry down and put a good man, a top man, on the job of trailing Phil and Della. Don't stand staring at me, Sam. Get on with it. I'm sorry, Inspector. I'll put one of the boys on the trail right away. Richard and Bella Parker. Well, hurry, Sam. Here's Lindsay, Inspector. Inspector Hearthstone, if you're arresting me for murder, you're on the wrong street. Why, Lindsay? Because I didn't kill anybody. It's more likely I myself will be killed. Again, why, Lindsay? Because it's as plain as the nose on your face that young newspaper reporter Phil Richards and his girlfriend Della Parker are committing these murders. Oh, really? Well, thanks for the information. But tell me, what evidence have you to support that story, Lindsay? The evidence of what I suppose is millions of dollars in dope that I found concealed in our uptown warehouse. The only people who could have concealed it there are my secretary, Della Parker, and her fiancé, that newspaper reporter. They're the only ones. It's a beautiful story of true, Lindsay. Especially from a man who's been on the scene in suspicious circumstances of two murders. I don't care where I was. I'm telling you the truth, Inspector Hearthstone. I... All right, Lindsay. I'm going to do a funny thing. Detective Cook, Sam. Yeah, Inspector. Take the handcuffs off, Lindsay. Release him. No charge. What? Release him? That's what I said, Sam. Release him. You may go, Lindsay. But remember, you may be watched. You're letting me go? I have my reasons. Show Mr. Lindsay out, Sam. And in the meanwhile, Della Parker and Phil Richards are walking along the dark street where Phil's mother lives. And Phil is saying, I think you were imagining things, sweetheart. Nobody was following us. But just to settle you down, I got the idea of slipping through one door of that restaurant and out the other. Phil, I'm worried about you. What was that strange thing you said was in those notes of your editor, Martin Bayard? Oh, I'm about to be your wife, darling. We shouldn't have secrets. Please, dear. I think Bayard went nuts before he was killed. His notes say a woman was in the dope racket with Lindsay. And who was the woman, Phil, darling? Oh, but come kiss me first and then tell me. I tell you, Bayard, big city editor or not, was nuts. <laughs> it was you, Della. You. Give me those papers, Bayard. Give them to me. Della. Oh, God, forgive me. It was you. I'll give you nothing. God, help me. You are a murderess. A murderess. And the queen of dope, too. Now give me those papers. Not this no. side of... Oh, you killed me. And good... Now for those papers. Here they are. And now into this sewer with them. And the gun. Help! Help! Murder! Murder! Help! What's happened, lady? My fiancé's been killed. I was afraid of this. Oh, take me to a phone office or I must call Inspector Hearthstone. Hearthstone of the desk squad? Yes, he's working on the case that led to this murder. Well, you can use this police phone right here, miss. I'll get him. Hello? Officer Blake reporting a murder. Give me Inspector Hearthstone. He on me. Inspector Hearthstone, this is Della Parker. That terrible man, Lindsay, has just murdered Phil Richards. And a few minutes later, we find an hysterical girl, Della Parker, confronting Inspector Hearthstone. And I keep on saying, Inspector Hearthstone, you're responsible for Phil's murder. You knew a desperate gang of dope peddlers was after him, and you failed to protect him. I'll never live long enough to forgive myself, Della. I should have done something. Recriminations won't get us anywhere, Della. All we can do is help each other. And when I bring Phil's killer to justice, I hope you'll find it in your heart to forgive me. <laughs> Steady, my dear. First thing is, did you actually see your employer, Lindsay, shoot down Phil? It was dark, but I'm sure it was Mr. Lindsay. I'll swear it on the witness stand. And I'll swear, too, that you were the cause. Please, my dear child, forget your feelings toward me for a minute. I only ask you to help me. Do that first, then hate me all you like. I'll understand and forgive 
How can I help you, Inspector Hostel? Detective Cook, bring Lindsay in. Come in, Lindsay. Don't try any tricks. I wasn't near that reporter, Phil Richards, when he was killed. Detective Cook is mad. Here are some reports from our narcotics squad, Lindsay. Read these letters. There are tips written into narcotics putting three known dope czars on the spot. And you are one of them. I don't know anything about them. They're, uh, they're typewritten. They were written on the typewriter in your office. And here is a confidential report to narcotics from the murdered city editor, Martin Bayard, the man Phil Richards worked for. What does it say? It says a woman is the head of your dope ring. And don't deny you were operating one, Lindsay. That woman was Mr. Lindsay's wife, Inspector Harstone. That's possible, Della. It's a lie, Inspector Harstone. My wife had nothing to do with dope. Watch what you're saying, Lindsay. Your wife may be the woman. It's not my wife. She's not the killer. This girl, Della Parker, was the brains. She worked the whole thing. She used my messenger service to pass dope. What are you saying, Mr. Lindsay? Inspector Hearthstone, isn't it enough that Phil Richards is a fine, clean boy who loved me? Oh, Phil, so why should you have been murdered? Because Phil found out who the leader of the dope ring was, who the wholesale murderer was. I begged Phil to stay out of this. And he undoubtedly knew who the woman was who operated the dope ring. She directed the murder to gain complete control for herself. Mr. Lindsay, I'll scratch your eyes out your white shot, Phil! Get her, Sam. Easy now, Della. Sam, now tell us just where you found the papers and the murder gun that killed Phil. Sure. I got him out of the sewer trays near where he was shot. A natural place for a woman to throw them. And you, Della Parker, were the only woman on the scene of Phil's murder. Oh, that's right. Accuse me for your own mistakes, Inspector Hearthstone. I hope you'll forgive me for this, Della. I'll not forgive you for anything. Not even for arresting you for murder? <laughs> Grab her, Sam, and handcuff her. No, no, Della, no. Gag him, Della. Your mistake, Della, was in being a little too clever, too cooperative, too sweet with the unfortunate boy you murdered. Probably the only person who ever loved you. You can't prove that I murdered him, Hearthstone. You'll find I can prove everything, Della, when I present the evidence I have at your trial. You'll prove nothing! And you'll remember this when the dark and eternal door of the execution chamber closes on you. No, no! That's all, Sam. Charge her with murder. And turn Lindsay over to the narcotics division as a dope handler. Okay, Inspector Hearthstone. Uh, my only regret is that the men we put to trail this woman and Phil Richards on his murder journey lost them. I was trying to protect Phil from this very thing. And thus, Hearthstone of the Death Squad writes Solved in the files of the unheeded warning murder case. The part of Inspector Hearthstone was played by Alfred Shirley and was written by Frank Hummer, directed by Henry Howard, and is a presentation of CBS Radio. Listen in next Thursday at this same time for Hearthstone of the Death Squad in the Lost Wife murder case. Here is another CBS radio treat coming up right after station identification on most of these same stations. It's Joan Caulfield and Jeffrey Lynn in Accent on Youth, putting the accent on comedy in your Broadway playhouse. You'll enjoy this modern comedy about modern young folks in hilarious human adventures when you hear Broadway Playhouse, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. And remember, on the CBS radio network Fridays, Western Swing is footloose and fancy-free on the Spade Cooley Show. Listen for Hearthstone of the Death Squad in the Lost Wife murder case at this same time next
Thursday night. Your announcer is Art Hannah.